Okay. Oh wait, no, that's not the beginning. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, we well we tried it. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good whatever time it is, because we are online learning now. Welcome to the Mr. Wally Rocks YouTube channel. Today we're going to be going over absolute dating of rocks. I put these slides together just for you. Stay tuned. So, absolute dating, what does it mean? Relative dating, as you can see here, is going from youngest to oldest, or relatively dating one compared to the other. We did this a few weeks ago with uh, cross-cutting relationships and just figuring out which one's the youngest, which one's the oldest. Today we're doing absolute dating, putting a number on the rock. Here's another example. If you're going to relatively date them, you're obviously going to say the station wagon is less and the Bentley is more money, right? Now, absolute dating is when you put a number to it, right? This is selling for 13000 and this is selling for 600000 We're going to be putting numbers on fossils, not cars. So, relatively, younger layers are on top most of the time unless it's been overturned. Older layers are on the bottom, relatively. Now, absolute dating is when we take a piece of that rock and we say that that rock is $125 million and the rock below it is 130 million years ago. The study of this is called geochronology, the study of determining the age of the rocks. The problem with absolute dating is that it, it's not completely exact. It has like a, a time error depending on what radioactive isotope you're using. We're gonna get in this, here we go. Now, here's how it works. What do we use to know the exact time of a rock that is formed? Hmm? Anybody? Anybody? No one can respond because this is a video and we're not in class. But anyway, we're going to move on. If you, you guessed it, the minerals inside of the rock tell you about the age of the rock that formed. How do we do this? We take the rock. We look at the rock underneath a microscope. We look at it and we get this picture here. This picture is called a petrograph and it shows all of the minerals in a really small section of a sliced rock. So I did this in college. It's where you take your rock, you cut it with a rock saw, you put it on a slide right here and this slide looks like this underneath the microscope. Now if you get to get more specific we'd look at these little tiny rocks or little tiny minerals here and we would use them to figure out the age absolute age of the rock right so you, you pinpoint the mineral you want to use and you put it in a sensitive high resolution ion microprobe or shrimp for short this fancy device with this blurry picture is from Wikipedia it's very fancy and expensive. We usually shipped off the slides to go get them tested because it's very expensive and there aren't very many. Uh, you kind of have to like get put on a waiting list to do it. Anyway, it tells us the mass ratio of the radioactive isotopes to disintegration products. Now, you're going to be asking what are those? We're going to get into that. <clears throat> Here is the why on how... Wait, what? Here is the why it works. Minerals are made of atoms. We all know that. These minerals, on you get smaller and smaller and you, on a molecular level, they're made of these atoms here. This is not the exact structure of that, but anyway, the atoms are put together in this network called a crystal lattice, and we're going to be looking at the ratio of how many different atoms there are within the minerals, okay? Now we're going to divide these atoms up into stable atoms, like this table here, very stable, all four legs, and unstable atoms. It only has three legs, so it's very unstable. Now the inside of an atom is made up of protons and neutrons. Here's the symbol for what type of atom it is. 
say you have a radioactive isotope. That is your unstable atom here. Now this unstable atom is going to break off or disintegrate into two products. You're either going to get a uh, kickback of energy, gamma wave radiation, uh, different particles, alpha, beta, um, and then you're going to get the nice, happy, stable atom out of this because originally it's unstable because it has too many somethings. Now perhaps when you hear the word radioactive isotope, you, it has a negative connotation in your mind. This is because of nuclear gets a bad rap. And all nuclear chemi chemistry is, is the atoms breaking down into stable, more stable atoms and giving off some kind of energy. This is how we use uh, nuclear reactors. We, this given off energy gives us heat that spins the turbines to give, give us energy, right? Um, sadly, this is also how bombs are created, where we supercharge the disintegration. It happens instantly, and it gives off a bunch of energy, and this energy can vaporize a whole town. So there's a lot of energy in radioactive isotopes. Now, here we have one, two, three, four, five, six radioactive isotopes. They're each, I'm going to pick three of them to go through the disintegration process. We now have three radioactive isotopes and three stable atoms. The time it took for this to happen, for all three of them to decay, is what's called a half-life. This is where half of the material gets transmitted or gets dis disintegrated into a stable atom called a disintegrate product. Here, let's, let's call it a half-life. Let's go over some vocab real quick. The radioactive isotope is an unstable atom within a mineral that disintegrates over time. Here's the unstable atom. The disintegration itself is the breaking of the unstable atom. Boom, right here. And energy or particles get released. Here's the release. And a stable atom forms. Disintegration product is the stable atom that's left over. Right here. Half-life is the time it takes for half of the radioactive isotopes to disintegrate. One, two, three, four, five. Five out of ten. Half. The time it took for that to happen is the called the half-life. Three seconds, for example. Anyway, back to the sensitive high-resolution ion microscope, the shrimp. Is this tells us the mass ratio between radioactive isotope and disintegration products. You should know what that means by now, right? The radioactive isotope is the atom before it disintegrates. The product is after, okay? This tells us the ratio between the two. So just like in the last slide, it tells us the ratio of how many stable atoms per how many radioactive isotopes. And it, when it tells us the ratio you can get the half-life, therefore the amount of time that the rock or fossil has been sitting there. How old it is? The absolute age. We crack the code. Here's an example. Here we have half-lives, here we have fraction of original sample, here we have the percent of original sample and the percent of the product. The half-life count is at zero. We have one, 100% of original, 0% disintegration, 100% radioactive isotopes seen here. As we slowly decay the radioactive isotope into stable atoms or disintegration products, it'll move along and it'll give us a new ratio and then I've stopped it once it gets to half. 
right? So our half-life count is now one because half of the isotopes, radioactive isotopes, are now disintegration products. The fraction is half. The original percent of the radioactive isotope is only 50. The products are 50. And then we're going to keep going. More radioactive more radioactive isotopes begin to convert themselves and disintegrate into the products. We are now at half-life count number two. The same amount has, of time has passed. The, and that time depends on what... Uh, and that time depends on what atom you're using. So right now, one-fourth of the original samples left. One, two, three, four, five. Five out of 20, one-fourth. 25%. And 75% is still disintegration product, right? We're slowly con being converted to stable atoms. Here we go again. Half-life three. One-eighth of the sample is still there. One-eighth of the radioactive isotopes. 12.5% of the original sample the original radioactive, and then 87.5% is disintegrated into stable atoms. I'm just going to move through this. Here's some of the percents. And we are at the final fifth half-life. Now, depending on different... Now, depending on what type of sample you're using, what type of atom, the half-lives are going to be different. So, what element or atom should you use if you're trying to date a dinosaur fossil versus a mammoth fossil? Now, mammoths were around, now, mammoths were around not so long ago. Dinosaurs, a lot longer. All right, here, I, I know this because on the reasons reference tables, pull that up right here. Doo, doo, doo. Mammoths are within 1.8 million years ago. Dinosaurs are, are between 200 and 250 million years ago. So if we go back here, which element should you use? If we look at the reference table, we have, these are the radioactive isotopes, these are the disintegration, this is the half-lives. Since mammoths have existed closer to today, we are going to use carbon-14. The reason for that is because the half-life is shorter, right? So if I pull up a calculator real quick, I get my calculator. And I say that one half-life is 5.7 times 10 to the third, which is 5.7 times 10, three times. One, two, three. We get 5,700 years. This is the length of one half-life. Now, we just discussed in the previous slides, five half-lives, we're getting pretty small percentages at that time, right? Five times 5,700 is 28,000 years. So the really the maximum extent that we can go is about 10, 10 to 15 half-lives. I'd really say 10 half-lives before your error gets really big. Because after 10 half-lives, I did the math, and after 10 half-lives, you're only looking at about 0.097%. That would mean that when you take 10 half-lives times 5,700, the maximum amount of time you can use carbon-14 for is around 57,000 years. Anything after that, the error is going to be way too large. Okay, moving on.
here's you can do your mammoth up to 50, five, 57,000 years. Dinosaur, 